Well, good morning, and thank you, Deb, for inviting us to present um, today. We're really excited to be here. Um, Brian is with me, and he's going to talk about himself here in a little bit. Um, but we greatly appreciate the opportunity to take a few minutes of your time and talk about how we can work together to use assistive technology devices and services to increase successful outcomes in the areas of education, employment, and community living with individuals who are experiencing disabilities, injuries, as well as our seniors. I'm Lori Brooks, and I have had the pleasure of working in a variety of positions with our program since 1991. And I've had the honor of serving as president for ATI since 2001. Brian, would you like to talk about yourself? Well, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Sacre, and I have been an AT specialist for uh, a little over seven years now at ATI. Before that, I was in the realm of education as an English teacher overseas in South Korea for a somewhat distinguished 13-year career. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Yeah. So... Brian will be taking us uh, or talking more about all of our specific services um, but in more in depth, but we'll take a moment really quick and tell you a little bit about our company. So we are Access Technologies Inc., also known as ATI. We're a nonprofit organization that was developed in 1994 to continue the great work of the Federal Technology Act program, which for our state is known as the Oregon Statewide Assistive Technology Program. Um, the OSAT program, Oregon Statewide Assistive Technology Program, we implement um, a variety of services mandated by Congress that are designed to increase access to assistive technology, as well as acquisition of assistive technology devices and services. We also implement services for Oregon's National Deaf-Blind Equipment Distribution Program, which is known as I Can Connect Oregon. And that program provides devices and services to individuals with combined hearing and vision loss so that they can be more successful with telecommunication activities. Next slide, please, Brian. So at ATI, we are all about assistive technology devices and services. Some of our staff probably even dream about AT devices. But in general, as you may know, assistive technology is defined as any item, piece of equipment, software, or product that's used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. Next slide, Brian, I think you're up. So assistive technology differs a little bit from universal design in that uh, universal design is a process uh, that enables uh, people without adding anything. It, it's implemented uh, as, as the product is being built. Um, what we see in the image uh, is the Multnomah County Courthouse that employs universal design in that a person can use the restrooms there uh, accessibly by accessing the sinks and the changing tables with a, with a clearance that a person using a wheelchair can get under. If we look in the background there, the, the bathroom is, is equipped with, with the, the bars that help a person transfer uh everything is is within reach uh of of the maximum allowable amount of people and that that was into the design of the the structure assistive technology differs from universal design in that i like to say that in a uh, in a fire escape situation uh, if we look at an older building that uh didn't have a fire escape built into it, they they bolt on a solution outside of the building uh, where a person crawls through a window and climbs through a network of stairs. 
uh, which gets the result that it needs, but it is added on at extra cost, at extra cost, at redesign. Um, and it is serviced by a specialist, whereas universal design stuff uh, can be done by mainstream technology and is uh, more and more common these days as we become more aware of it. Specifically, in the digital realm, we have gotten a lot better over time. I'm not saying perfect in any way, but I am saying that uh, as, as we no longer go to the water board to pay our water bill and we pay it online, it has become more accessible through universal design uh, than it has in the past. We're still moving along, but yeah, we, we share a common goal in assistive technology and universal design in that we are trying to get that independence for the individual. Because assistive technology costs uh, additional money, it must be funded. And not, oh, go ahead. Okay. And AT yeah. tends to be funded uh, when, when we're younger by our school systems. Uh, anyone in school in I think anywhere in Oregon and all of its territories is entitled to a free and appropriate public education that does include assistive technologies. So a lot of children have an IEP, an individualized education plan, as we know. Uh, and then, uh, well, well, that that is funded by the schools. Uh, it's when they begin to reach adulthood that the funding comes from different places. So. Uh, there are government programs uh, that, that exist to help fund technology. Private health insurance funds assistive technology quite a lot. But there are rehabilitation and job training programs. Uh, as a nonprofit, our lead agency is vocational rehabilitation. And everybody that goes to voc rehab is uh, put into a, a, an IPE, which is an individual plan for employment. And everybody's IEP includes a line for their technology needs. Uh, when, when the Assistive Technology Act was passed, uh, the assumption from the legislators was that employers would become more and more aware of assistive technology and employers would be the primary provider through reasonable accommodation and human resources uh, of assistive technologies. Uh, it's been about 30 years and uh, th th they're getting there. Private foundations, charities, and civic organizations like the Blanche Fisher Foundation, uh, the Lions Club, uh, and uh, the Easter Seals, uh, among others, a great number of others, uh, also uh, have funds that are earmarked to provide assistive technology to those who need them. If we go to our website at www.accesstechnologiesinc.org. Uh, can someone tell me if I just put a web browser over the top of the presentation? You did. Awesome. If we look under resources, there is a spot for assistive technology funding, and this is a good jumping off point to find financial assistance in acquiring assistive technologies. Uh, if you happen to know of a funding source that isn't listed, please let us know. There is a, a way to contact us via phone, email, a few other ways on the website. So as Oregon Statewide Assistive Technology Program, we are grant funded to provide a certain number of functions uh, in order to meet the qualifications of the grant, as well as feel pretty good about doing the things that uh, that make the world a little bit better for people. Uh, first and foremost, I'm coming to you live from Salem, Oregon uh, at our lab. Our lab has uh, about 2000 pieces of hardware, maybe a little less these days and uh, about, and we'll say 500 or so pieces of software that uh, people can 
access by way of device demonstrations. Device demonstrations take about 30 minutes of a consumer's time. Anybody in Oregon that wants a demonstration can have one. They just contact us to make an appointment. They tell us what their functional difficulty may be and the goal that they have in mind. I'll show them some technologies. I'll let them actually experience the technology uh, in the first person, as in hands-on experience with the device. And um, from there, a person can make a better decision as to whether a specific specialized piece of technology will actually suit their needs, opposed to uh, just doing the old buy it and try it method. Uh, exploiting the return policies of various retailers. If a person is kind of still iffy about a piece of technology, they can borrow a device for uh, a 30-day uh, period of time. Usually that incorporates a $9 cleaning and maintenance fee of, of the, the piece of equipment. Um, and that doesn't just include the things inside the lab, we actually do a fair bit of what they call durable medical equipment in our device loans. People all around, honestly, the greater Willamette Valley area of Oregon, but also all throughout Oregon, have borrowed and can borrow uh, things like aluminum trifold ramps uh, to, to help get into and out of a home sometimes a relative is visiting and they only need a ramp for just a short period of time. And uh, that that $9 uh, rental fee for that 30 days uh, is uh, still considered a bit of a bargain. Our device lending library is found at the top of our home page under the device loan uh, button. Uh, the device loan library online is currently arranged by age groups as well as device types. If we were to select something, um, let's go with the hip talk plus. When we click on an item, we find out what the availability of the item is, how much it costs to borrow it, a brief description of it, um, we are in the process of a website design where we're, we're going to add a little bit more functionality and uh, a little bit more usability to our, our online library. Uh, it is still still coming along. Um, but yeah, if uh, if you have a difficult time navigating the device loan, a lot of people just know our phone number and they call us and ask for the availability of certain things. And we have a very informative front desk fellow who is uh, really good at answering those questions or passing them on to me. <laughs> Another aspect of our grant is that we do some state financing programs. Uh, what that implies, for example, is an AT purchasing plan. Uh, a lot of times when people come to our office, uh, once they find us, there is a bit of um, confusion because they, they might be here to look at a speech generating device like the, the, the little guy in this picture here. Uh, and the front of the house does sell a lot of durable medical equipment at cost. Uh, one common question we encounter is the, the, the question of whether we deal with uh, private insurances and Medicaid, Medicare ourselves. And one function of the grant is that under Medicaid, Medicare, you're allowed five years between devices. And if somebody is really uh, rambunctious with their walker or rollator, it might not make that five years. So we kind of exist to keep those costs as low as possible uh, so that a person can replace their device as affordably as possible. And that's why uh, dealing directly with insurance is, is not possible for what we do. We do a fair bit of what we call cooperative buying. 
cooperative buying implies that a person has come to us and maybe they don't have all the money up front, uh, but they anticipate that they could probably pay it off. They just maybe don't have a credit card to do so, or they they don't like the the rate of of a loan, or it's just you know they they just need to make three quick payments. Uh, we can cooperatively buy with them, which is to say, uh, they they can either take the device home in a lease to own uh, agreement, or they can uh, do a layaway plan or uh, any combination uh, in order to meet our mission of ensuring that they can acquire their technology and and access and use it. We also uh, are responsible for device reutilization. Anything that ages out of our lab or is donated by folks who have either outgrown their technology or have passed on uh, or thought that they needed it and turns out they didn't. Uh, they, they can donate that item to us. We clean it up. Uh, anything from the lab, we also clean up and we rehome it for a, a modest fee. Uh, we have done a fairly brisk business in things such as Hoyer lifts and power chairs. Uh, and we, we get a fair number of walkers due to uh, the, the, the FDA regulation saying that people cannot return for a refund their commodes. Uh, we, we also acquire a fair number of commodes on donation and we rehome them as cheaply as we can to, to get them a new, a new home with someone who might, might need it. We also are responsible for a number of public awareness activities. This is one of them. All the things on on this page so far we we've discussed they they have been at a at a modest cost. Again, uh, we try not to get the consumer to have to pay very much or anything uh, for for what they need. Um, and if a person happens to need more than just a demonstration, we do assessments. Uh, assessments are done as a fee for service. Again, Voc Rehab is our lead agency, but uh, there are a number of case managers who use our services, a lot of private insurances. Uh, sometimes it's just private individuals who they just don't know where to begin. They, they, they might be new to a disability or they might be uh, new to a new level of disability that they weren't anticipating and they just need to know uh, at a deeper level of understanding what, what is possible. Uh, our, our assessments include uh, ADA workplace assessments that usually starts in the parking lot or at the curb and we go entirely through a person's workday and make sure that everything is accessible. Uh, those ones are a little bit fun from my perspective in that sometimes I point out things that nobody in the building had thought of. Uh, that's fairly common. Assistive technology assessments, of course, uh, those could be for low vision access, uh, hearing access, uh, a lot of executive functioning difficulty. So uh, timing in the workplace or uh, understanding the steps of doing a process. Uh, I've got some tools for that. Computer access assessments. Most jobs these days, including the one I'm doing right now, are done with your hands or at least in the presence of a computer. So computer access assessments have become extremely common and they tend to be tied well with ergonomic risk assessments. Uh, my title on my business card uh, includes the letter COEE, which stands for Certified Office Ergonomic Evaluator. I, uh, I move a lot of furniture. Any equipment that we assess and recommend, we also provide trainings for. So if somebody has assistive technology devices, if they have software apps, we make sure that they know how to use them. If I recommend uh, anything, 
uh, that that might require a little bit of learning, I, I anticipate that I'll spend at least a couple hours with the individual at delivery, making sure they know what every button does, how to change the batteries, how to turn it on, how to program it, use cases, um, and follow on that usually happens when when a person's somewhat overconfident and uh, then they get into the real world and they 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 realize that there there might be some features that they may not have paid attention to so we 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 come back around we also do trainings on how to access computers and foot devices and software um, most organizations use microsoft office software and i have reluctantly gotten a lot better at learning how to train people in uh, what what exactly Microsoft Excel is used for and how to drive it. Uh, tablets and access devices and apps. Uh, a lot of assistive technology is hyper-specialized and they tend to come on iPad devices because Apple makes exactly one operating system related tablet the, the iPad, and so it's easy to maintain your software on that one device versus Android, which goes across a variety of brands and languages and models. I, I believe uh, I'm going off of old data, but there were over 6,000 different Android devices made in the early 2020s. Uh, and that's, that's a lot to keep up and maintain. So a fair number of applications uh, require an Apple iPad uh, to operate, and we train on those. We also look for ergonomic and workplace accommodations. Again, if I'm showing someone a chair, I make sure that they can reach down and make the adjustments to the chair. If we're working with an electric height adjustable desk, we make sure the person knows the frequency that they should be adjusting their sit to stand positioning, as well as how to do so. I'm also pretty proud uh, that we we work a little bit with uh, making the digital world more accessible in that uh, people can contact us and ask us if their website, their PDF, even their email communications are as accessible as they can possibly be. I run workshops quite uh, well as on demand as possible uh, that that implements accessibility in every level of what we call ICT. Uh, internet uh, information communication technologies. Uh, after four hours of, of the training, uh, I've never had anyone say that they didn't learn anything new. A lot of people are kind of flying by the seat of their pants as far as using Microsoft products, and uh, they they don't understand often how just simple changes can actually make those documents readable by the maximum um, number of people. As Lori said before, we are the administrators of the I Can Connect program, the National Deaf Blind Equipment Distribution Program. Uh, this program provides free telecommunications devices and software and training to individuals who experience that dual sensory loss. There is no age limit to the I Can Connect program. We've got them as young as two and as old as nearly 102. Uh, in the program, I, we, we cover the whole state. So if you know somebody that experiences vision that is worse than 2200 in their good eye and their hearing is considered by a professional to be uh, severely or worse, uh, deaf in, in their good ear, as well as below 400% of the federal poverty line, they are entitled to this program that will provide them with a phone that they can access better. It might be something that captions video calls a little bit better. It could be a computer that is accessible for email purposes or uh, Zoom calls to stay in touch with friends and loved ones and, and bill collectors and all that. Um, it's a great program. 
I know that we, we need just a few more people in it. They are out there. And if you know anybody, please have them get in touch with us. In order to receive services from us, uh, we, we uh, ask that you call or email to set up an appointment for demonstrations. I cover the state. Uh, and sometimes I have the equipment with me while I'm out on the road. So if someone comes to our office and asks to see something, there's a, there's a pretty good chance we might be able to fit them in. But if I'm not there or if uh, the equipment isn't there, then uh, an appointment will be necessary. The exception being a lot of our low vision uh, equipment can be demonstrated uh, on an as needed basis. For assessments, we ask that you call for a quote. A lot of times, if it's a private individual, I will ask first if they have a voc rehab counselor, if, they, if their goals are vocationally related, uh, I, I would strongly recommend that they, they get this, this program that already exists to cover the cost of their tools. Uh, if they're not vocationally inclined, I would still ask if they have a case manager because we have a case, uh, a K plan number that would allow us to also provide an assessment for an individual and, and it wouldn't cost them out of pocket. If a person wishes to purchase generalized durable medical equipment, we do have a storefront and we also have our online marketplace. Uh, people who don't necessarily wish to donate their equipment to us, they can also resell their equipment on our assistive technology marketplace. The listing costs nothing. And we like to just describe it as a Craigslist for durable medical and other assistive technologies. For specialized equipment, um, pretty much anything that's in the lab that isn't low vision equipment, you'll, you'll want to call for a quote quite often because we're a nonprofit. If somebody uh, attends a demonstration with me and they're asking, how do I acquire something like this that's working well? We'll probably just go shopping online together right then and there so they can kind of get a realistic expectation of what the item's going to cost and, and how it's going to ship in. And they can, they can do that on their own. Uh, but there are some who would rather uh, just deal directly with the person. So they'll just say that, that, you know, Amazon's fine, but how much would it cost to just buy it directly from you? And so we would provide an official quote. Generally, it, it happens almost immediately. And uh, we just tell them how much it costs and when to come back to pick it up and pay for it. The I Can Connect program has an application process. Uh, honestly, getting in is the trickiest part of the I Can Connect program. You will need a medical professional uh, that is qualified uh, to, to make the attestation that the vision and hearing loss are up to the, the, the demands of the program. They'll also need to explain how that combined vision and hearing loss affects the person's ability to just simply acquire mainstream technology. Uh, we make that as straightforward as we possibly can, uh, but a lot of times the medical professional will just send us a person's medical file and the federal government does not believe that I am qualified to interpret that medical data. So we still have to contact the doctor and ask them to, uh, to do that, that attestation to the, the letter of the federal government's demands. The other half of it is the individual does have to show financial uh, proof that they are not wealthy. Uh, this is usually done in the form of an insurance letter or, um, or from a, a heavily redacted three months of bank statements or, or tax returns. There, there are a few different ways to do so, but again, some folks just, uh, they, they, uh, 
they believe that information is private and and that that tends to be where the snags come from but once a person's in the program once we've got them for a year uh well, i put on my santa claus hat and we make things happen So that's who we are and what we do. Um, and for the rest of the presentation, I'd like to kind of talk you through some of the technologies that we do have in our lab that do go on the road quite a lot. Uh, when a person finishes their IEP, they are faced with the choice of uh, continuing with their education or going into the work world. So first we'll look at some technologies for education. Uh, the C pen is maybe one of the most popular pieces of assistive technology that's come out in the last, say, decade or so. Uh, prior to this, reader pens were large. They were about the size of a small banana. They were slow. They could only do one word at a time. You had to scan at a very steady-handed pace and you had an 80% chance that the reader pen would get it right. Uh, the C pen, now you can use it like a highlighter. You can swipe quickly over multiple lines of text in a hurry, and it can retain uh, both audio and um, visual uh, text. Once the text is highlighted, swiped, uh, the device almost immediately starts reading it out loud. Uh, a lot of folks don't want these things read out loud and honestly, they don't get terribly, terribly loud. So if you're in a busy environment trying to read a menu, you might want to use the included earphone uh, for, for better accuracy. If a person has a phone and about $100, there is an app called the One Step Reader. Uh, the One Step Reader takes pictures and uses something called optical character recognition, OCR, uh, in order to uh, distinguish the noise from the text. And then once it's got the text, it puts the text in a digital format and you can highlight both the text of the sentence being read as well as the word being read. You can modify the font so that it's easier to read, and it also reads aloud. And when it's reading aloud, you have the ability to change the speed, the volume, the voice, and the pitch, uh, as well as save these recordings for later. Uh, someone who's more ambitious might be able to take multiple pictures and create a bigger file that they can perhaps listen to in their car as they're uh, driving along. If a person doesn't have $100, Microsoft put out an app called Seeing AI. It's been out for Apple devices for forever. And uh, just this year, they announced and released on Android. Um, the Reading AI app is designed more for the intended user being low vision or blind. And it points the camera and uh, the, the artificial intelligence tries to find colors, currency, objects, faces, texts, uh, barcodes, and it interprets that data audibly to the user. Um, my experience with the blind community uh, says that it's it's appreciated. The effort is, is there. The, Accuracy could use a bit of improvement uh, on almost all levels, but uh, the good news is Microsoft continues to work with it. And as the last couple of years, the those letters A and I showing up in everything, I think they're they're going to probably continue to uh, point to this app as uh, one of those amazing things that can be done with it. We work a lot with built-in text-to-speech. Um, if I can get a person to access the visual world in a verbal manner uh, and save them some money in the process, 
I'm, I'm all for it. So Windows 10 and 11, they use a narrator in iOS. The Apple devices, they use voiceover. And uh, I, I, I've, I've spent a considerable amount of time showing various people how to turn this feature on, how to navigate it, how to adjust the levels of verbosity so they're not getting too much or too little information from what's on screen. We also help people choose proper literacy software. Uh, anyone that is in the schools, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but traditionally, a lot of schools, they get one or two pieces of literacy software that they can distribute to their students. Uh, frequently, I've seen Read and Write Gold from the Text Help Corporation and Kurzweil 3000. Uh, being fairly commonly distributed among the schools. Um, what I say about a lot of literacy software is that it's the difference between driving a Ford and a Dodge and a Chevy. Uh, they all kind of do a lot of the same things. It's just they, the feel is a little bit different for each piece of software. And that's why we do the demonstration. So if a person only knows that one thing, they can they can make a more informed decision by by seeing what each uh, different piece of software might be able to do. Smart pens, uh, I don't know why we put this in the plural. There's really only the one smart pen out there in the world uh, made by the LiveScribe Corporation. Uh, smart pens, uh, as, as a lot of folks in education might be aware, they use a special kind of paper uh, so that the pen, which is equipped with a camera, a microphone, and a speaker, uh, can, while, while you're writing, it, it can know your location on the page so that when you tap on the page later to retrieve your notes, the ambient audio that was occurring will play back from that moment. Uh, the generation two devices that have come out since the pandemic have had some headache inducing connectivity issues, but when they work well, these smart pens change lives. Uh, if a person maybe has gone more digital than paper and they wanna save some trees, Microsoft OneNote can do a lot of the things that the smart pen can do and then some. Uh, it, it is a great tool. It costs no money. Uh, and much like a smart pen, I've seen it change a lot of people's trajectory. One of the coolest lines on my resume is I am a dragon trainer. If you go on Google and look up dragon training, the top result is actually somehow me. Dragon uh, has been around for about 23-ish years, uh, well over 20 years. And it, <clears throat> like, like a lot of assistive technologies and AI-influenced products, it has gotten better over time with correction. It's also gotten more expensive over time. I am happy when a person maybe just needs to be able to dictate and we can show them how to do it using what's built in uh, to a computer. Uh, and if that is sufficient, uh, that's great. Uh, but if a person does need that full control of a computer, and by computer, in this case, I mean a Windows-based computer, uh, not, not a Mac, uh, Dragon, is is often that solution that that makes all the difference in the world for a person. Uh, there's mathematics software to help folks that are getting into the higher levels of mathematics. Math Talk is one of them. Equatio from the Text Help folks is another one. Uh, yeah, uh, they they. They make doing math without the use of your hands possible, uh, but there is there is a secondary learning curve that a, a person who just uses their hand to write out 
a lot of their uh, mathematical equations uh, does not necessarily have to think about. Uh, Greek letters, for example, uh, being able to call them up as opposed to just recalling that the squiggly thing is a sigma, uh, that takes a lot of extra brain power for an individual. So it, um, it does require additional training. FM systems exist out there. Uh, I was just at the AT Ties conference about a week and a half ago, and uh, we happened to have one of these on our table and helped uh, an attendee out quite a bit with it. Uh, but the way an FM system works is if a person has a little bit of hearing loss uh, and they're in a noisy environment, uh, one person who's intended to speak, the lecturer, the teacher, the the host, the MC, they, they wear a microphone enabled device on their person uh, that might include a lavalier mic. It might include a lapel mic. Uh, it, some it, in some way a an audio recording device. Whereas the other person is wearing an earpiece that also has a mic that can uh, can be incorporated into the person's audio profile to take out the noise of the guy beside them clicking a pen or a conversation happening. They're, they're great for maintaining focus as well as hearing more clearly. Uh, the motivas are what we call the Cadillacs of, of FM systems, but the, there are newer systems out there that uh, compete well. The Ubi Duo is a highly specialized piece of equipment. It's used for two-way typing communication for folks who are non-verbal or deaf, but also uh, use English as a form of communication. Uh, it's basically like having two, two smartphones connected and you're just chatting back and forth, but the person has a person with the voice representing them holding the other device. They can type their questions. If they can't hear, the person can type the notes and the gist. If they're really fast, they can probably do the whole transcription of what's happening in a room but it makes sure that a person who's attending is still connected. We have a variety of alternative and augmentative communication devices uh, for people to try out. Um, it gives a voice to people who are nonverbal or struggle with being understood when they are verbal. There are live captioning apps out there still. We're going to blow over those for time considerations. A lot of it is actually covered in built-in live captioning. Uh, getting up and keeping a schedule is important for some folks and uh, waking up is sometimes difficult for various reasons. For, for hearing purposes, they do make a bed shaking alarm clock where a person puts this hockey puck shaped device under their pillow if they're brave or under their mattress if they're sensitive. And when the alarm goes off, that, that hockey puck vibrates first gently and then with a little bit more insistence. If a person's going to work, we try to help them dream big. Uh, in the old days, uh, people who went to vocational rehabilitation, their interests in the job might not have been taken into the full extent of importance that it might have been able to. So now when a person comes to uh, discuss their plan, uh, their interests are taken more into account. And that makes me happy for a variety of reasons. But uh, one of them is that it makes my job more varied and I get more out of the box kind of jobs uh, to look into. But uh, some folks have had some luck in ca coffee shops and bakeries, for example. Uh, this, this young lady here, um, she was employed by, she had like four jobs, but she was employed by a couple of different bakeries uh, to stamp the logo of the independent bakery onto their cups and their goodie bags. Uh, and she did, she did a few other functions, but uh, in order to stamp those logos on there, we did have to make this really nifty machine that was super specialized. Uh, so she would push a button, the stamp would come down and uh, she, she was probably twice as productive with that tool. Um, we also use 
things like uh, one-handed scissors. These ones are actually automated. Uh, there's a young man who worked at a movie theater who uh, basically pointed to a sign that said to tear your own theater ticket because he couldn't do that with his uh, hands. Uh, and he wondered why he was coming to work uh, to point to a sign. So we got him a pair of switch activated scissors and he's actually more involved in the process and uh, it's a more interactive experience for everyone. Uh, for some reason, a lot of my clients uh, for a while there, they were really into shredding. They, they really like document shredding. And we've had a couple of different tools out there. Some were custom made. My guy Jay right here, for example, we, we taped a couple of guides to his uh, tray so that he could slide the paper into the machine and not jam it up. Uh, and he, he works for a, a law firm doing their shredding once a week doing that. There are various services out there that some folks do. Uh, there's an app out there called Can Work, another one called Can Plan. Both of these apps allow a person to uh, see the end result of each step of a process. So for example, if a person needs to do laundry and they're not entirely sure how to get from dirty clothes to clean clothes that are folded and pressed, you take a picture of each step along the way. If a person's on a schedule, that's where can work helps out is that unlike can plan, I might have this backward, but uh, can work. Uh, you can actually say what time to start the process and it actually puts a notification on your phone to say, oh, okay, it's time to start step one. Are you ready? And it'll actually bring out that first picture and get the person going that way. Uh, we had one fellow with cerebral palsy. He was a loss prevention specialist at a pretty large retailer. He, uh, he uses a speech communication device that isn't always attuned to speak out loud. And when he would see some activity that needed further investigation, he would actually use this um, this this special switch here to notify the uh, the guys who could could do the uh, the actual tackling and and accusing uh, themselves. I have a few folks that are into social media marketing. Um, what we see here is a something called a bite stick or a mouth stick. Uh, if a person needs to access a touch screen and their voice isn't going to last a whole shift, they can they can bite the business into this thing and it should be capacitive enough to act as a finger tapping on the screen for them. Small business deliveries. Um, we have done a few things where we've attached a trailer uh, to a person's power chair so they can carry more equipment or delivery items, parcels and packages. Uh, for the nonverbal that are in deliveries, we've, we've found a few different devices that help them communicate that they have arrived and to tell the person receiving their item to have a great day. And yeah, it, it's uh, it's all about making dreams happen. So I've worked with people who are in counseling. I've worked with people who are working in car dealerships. I've, I've been in so many grocery stores in a professional capacity. Um, but yeah, if a person has a dream, they just give us a call and let us know what they want to do and what's potentially holding them back. Ryan, you have given us so much to think about. Um, I know, of course, there is a state tech act in all of our states. Um, we are blessed that you and Lori are re here to represent ATI, which is Oregon's tech act. And across the country, uh, the programs are involved in different levels of activity. Um, a lot of what you do is voc rehab and those who um, 
are are post secondary. I know Lori, you have talked about really partnering more with our schools, um, and particularly um, the area of transition and helping those kids who are thinking about entering the workforce uh, to explore and be aware of the tools that you may have for them. If a school has a student who is in that position of planning for um, uh, for for post secondary, are you, would you recommend that perhaps they call you to be part of a, a conversation or a uh, attend the IEP meeting? Um, what for most of the folks on with us are in the education realm. How can they partner to make sure that folks know about your services? Would you come and present to a school? Those are the right. kind of things I think we kind of want to know. Sure. Well, thank you, Deb. Um, so all of the above, everything that you said, I have directly been involved in IEP meetings. Um, I think Brian's had the opportunity to attend a few also. We will have parents and their child um, come into our center or schedule a demonstration in their area so they can learn more about different types of technologies. Um, we certainly present to anyone who will listen to us. So if you have a group of people, parents even, I think that's an, an area that Deb and I have talked about is really um, figuring out how we reach parents so that they know what technology is out there to help their kids. You guys do a great job in the school systems, but yes, when they're transitioning out, they really need to know what else is out there for them. So give us a call, have, have the parents or the student give us a call. If we can't see them in person, gosh, we know Zoom is great. So yeah, yeah, we're there for them. Yeah. 